how to start. I'm actually very humbled to be here and introduce Stuart and Maxine Frankel, who have, I've had the privilege to know for well over a decade. I've had the privilege to see their collection many times and see their extraordinary expansion of their collection over many times from the house to the museum next to the house to the warehouse. And I don't know what they bought here this week, but I told them, where do you put it? You have no more space. Um, so they will have to look for a new space. Um, I, I also have been very privileged to get to, to know them on a personal level, not just as extraordinary collectors. And, and I don't say this without really meaning it. It comes from the bottom of my heart. I think they are the most exceptional and best collectors in the United States today. Uh, and I will say a few words why I think that is. But over the years, we've also traveled together, visited with each other. Maxine and I have convinced each other to sit on each other's favorite non-for-profits organizations' boards. Um, so a friendship has also developed that I treasure very, very much. Um, the Frankels are not ordinary collectors. They're, uh, I, th I don't know where to start. I think for 50 years they have built what I would say is a, a true passionate collector's collection. And over those decades, they have been their own university in terms of acquiring knowledge and learning and seeing. They have an exquisite eye. They have abundant energy. They wear me out. So when I'm tired and have to sit down, they're just still going. And they never stop. They can't wait when the fair opens to go in and to start looking. Nothing good escapes their gaze. They will see and find every exquisite and the best pieces in every show, in every fair, and that's where they will go for. Because they're not collecting contemporary art or modern art or a particular artist or American art. They are collecting the best art that's out there. They focus very strongly on abstraction and minimalism, all mediums, all materials. But when you see their collection, and as you will see when Maxine walks you through it, it all sort of comes together. It all fits together. It all makes sense. It is one collection. They're not driven by trophy art. They don't care who's hit, who's in. They don't care whether it will appreciate in value or not. None of this matters to them. The only thing that matters is, is it a good work of art? Does it fit into our collection? Does it enrich our collection? Which I find truly exceptional in today's world where there's so much value-driven art collecting going on. Both Maxine and Stuart are from Michigan coming from born and raised in Detroit. They both went to the University of Michigan where they got their education. Then they moved briefly to New York because Stuart studied law there, which he ultimately decided he didn't like. Um, and then, and they're highly, highly involved in a level that I find truly appreciating. They don't care about sitting on boards just because it's a institution of a given name, of a given standing or recognition. They're involved with institutions that will further the visual and performing arts education. They will be getting involved with projects that wouldn't happen if they would not get involved. So they are a true inspiration. They're very generous to the institutions that they support they supported this museum of, uh, the Museum of the University of Michigan um, very generously. In 1997, they co-founded the Stuart, no, the Maxine and Stuart, Maxine first, Maxine and Stuart 
Frankel Foundation for the Arts. They have many honors, many of them which they share. Both of them are the recipient of the Michigan Governor's Award for Arts and Culture, which is a civic leadership award. Both of them are the recipient of the Helping Heart Award Common Ground Sanctuary for Outstanding Leadership and Volunteerism. Both of them are the recipients of Distinguished Service Outside of the Profession Award by the National Arts Education Association. Mixine also is an honorary Master of Fine Arts degree from Grand Park Academy, the first ever. Maxine sits on many, many cultural boards, too many to list them here all. Stewart considers himself a non-active participant in Maxine's active affiliations, but he is the most active critic of it all. At the end of the day, they are a most wonderful couple. Having had the ability to watch them over the years, it always makes me very happy to see them walk a fair, see a show, interact with each other. They truly do this together, and that's already a gift for me to see a couple that over five decades has built something special of what they have. It's a great pleasure for me to invite Maxine to come and talk to us about the collection. Thank you. Oh my, that's a lot to live up to. Now since there is no light on the lectern, just watch. Uh -huh. <laughs> It's called improvising. It's, it's an art term. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Christian, and thank you for your warm welcome. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, and I would like to welcome you to the Frankels. A brief history of how the collection began. As Stuart and I were married almost 52 years ago and spent the first year of our marriage living in New York, Stuart was getting a master's in tax law and I was what I termed a free spirit. It was an opportunity at that time. I had finished my junior year at the University of Michigan and in my last year, my senior year, course credits would not have transferred from New York back to Michigan. So instead, I became what I called a free spirit and I went to museums and galleries. And at this, at this time, they would call it self-educating. In those days, we called it going to museums and galleries. Uh, one day, I was at the Museum of Modern Art, and I came upon a painting that made me physically ill. And it's a memory that stays with me to this day. The painting had animal parts and human body parts floating in the canvas. And I was a 21-year-old who thought she knew everything. And I was furious with the museum that they would install something that made people physically ill. And I went home, and I call it perseverating. I just couldn't get the image out of my mind. I had been an English major at the university, and I was used to the power of the written word, but certainly not used to the power of a visual image. So I went back to the museum to find out more about this painting, and it was pa Picasso's Guernica. And from that moment on, I was converted to the visual arts. It, was, it became a passion in my life. At that point, Stuart was not interested in the arts, and he was interested in studying and getting his degree, and he was interested in learning more about practicing tax law. And he would go with me to museums and galleries. It wasn't that he didn't want to go, but he would sit and he would read a magazine or a newspaper, and he would be there with me, but not be there with me. And one day we were in, down in Florida, and we were in Palm Beach. We were walking down the street, and there was a contemporary glass gallery there. And Stuart said, come on, Maxine, let's go in and see this, see what they have there. Stuart is a person that enjoys process. And the 
gallery director, I still remember her name, this is close to 30 years ago, she, her name was Jo Met, and she spent three hours talking to us about process. And we walked out owning three works in glass, and that began our contemporary glass collection. Stuart was now engaged. For a birthday present, I bought Stuart, and I to this minute can't tell you why, two ceramic works. I do know why. I loved them, and I wanted to own them. So I bought them for a birthday present for Stuart. And while the glass is very off-putting, ceramics is very seductive, and you want to touch it. And that began, those two pieces began our ceramics collection. More than 20 years ago, we were on a trip to China and Hong Kong, and we were invited to a collector's home. He collected Chinese scroll paintings. And as he was describing the scrolls, he started to talk about the only contemporary American artist that works this way, an artist by the name of Bryce Marden. And Stuart leaned over and he said to me, Maxine, he's one of my favorite painters. And at that point, after 30 years of marriage, I didn't know Stuart had a favorite painter. <laughs> so our son was going to Columbia University in New York, and the next trip in, I made appointments with galleries that showed Bryce Marden's work. And we walked into the gallery, and they took us into one of these small rooms that's called a viewing room. And on the wall, they had two Christopher, they had two Bryce Martin works on paper and two Christopher Wilmarth sculptures. And the, Christopher Wilmarth was an artist working in the 70s and 80s in New York, and he worked in steel and glass, the tie back to our collection. And Stuart looked at me, and he said, this is it, kid. I, being an emotional person, started to cry because I knew what this meant. He was now fully engaged. The gallery director was appalled, did not know what to do with this woman who was crying, but she was a very happy, tearful woman. Those two pieces, four pieces, are now part of our collection. So, our collection begins at the turn of the 20th century and comes up to the present. We collect art that is minimal or abstract, regardless of the medium. The collection includes paintings, drawing, sculpture, works on paper, ceramics, some glass, and recently something, I don't know if this is a real term or something we made up, new media. Generally, if we like an artist's work, we will collect it in depth. We believe that artists have many ideas that they express in different ways through different materials. And we believe this is a special way of developing insight into an artist's career. In the beginning of this passion, this is, this is a collection that we have up above our works by Lee Bonteku and down below one of our favorite, our favorite ceramists, Richard DeVore. And in the middle, is you can see, is a copies a uh, bronze sculpture. Oh, and then there on the side, on the far left, are the little matchboxes by Lydia Clark. In the beginning of this passion, we installed the works in our home. Stuart's responsible for the installation and the placing of the work, and I'm responsible for all the record keeping. Please note that our installations are cross-discipline. We believe, again, that artists are communicating different ideas through different materials. About 15 years ago, the collection outgrew the house, and we did an addition just for art. Our neighbors couldn't believe it was just for art. They thought it was an indoor swimming pool or tennis court or a combination of the two. Uh, we believed at that time that we would have more than enough room that's a joke. The addition includes two galleries, two connecting corridors, an office, and an atrium. What you're looking at is a view over to our Fontana collection. Whoopsie. We're stuck. But it's a pretty view. Uh, 
this is, you can see a Salawit in the foreground, and then in the background, a Robert Mangold painting. And as I said, if we like an artist's work, we could co co collect it in depth. So there are many examples of both Mangold and Salawit in the collection. Yes. See, I have a director. I, this is, <laughs> always we're a team. Richard Serra, uh, this is a steel piece done in the early 70s, part of his prop series. And this is another view looking at the uh, Scott Burton table. On the Scott Burton table are several examples of uh, Nam Gabo's work and Lee Bontecu. And then in the background is an Ellsworth Kelly bronze. This is moving through the connecting corridor, and what you're looking at is an installation of Eduardo Chiita's works, including his ceramics, and a few David Smiths. Up, uh, up at the top is a David Smith from the 40s. And this is a view into the second gallery space. Uh, the white marble piece is Nam Gabo. On the right are works by John Mason, a remarkable 20th century ceramist. And then in the background, different examples of Anselm Kiefer's work. And the big steel and glass piece is Christopher Wilmarth. Seven years ago, Anselm Kiefer requested that we loan a very large painting of his to a U.S. Canadian retrospective. It's about 18 feet long, nine feet high, and very fragile, and is covered in real sunflower seeds. With reluctance, and serious reluctance, because it took a day to move all the artwork out of the gallery, bring in the crate, which had to be larger than the painting, and then take the painting off the wall safely and put it in the crate. It was, a, it was an awful experience, harrowing. But we did, we agreed to loan the painting because the, d the curator called and said, Kiefer is wants us to beg you to loan the painting. It's hard to turn an artist down. So we loaned the painting. That's a longer story and we will not go <laughs> into it today. Uh, very interesting. But because we loaned the painting, Kiefer was so delighted that he offered us for sale from his collection one of his steel and lead bookcases, which is a piece on the left of the slide. Yes, of course, we said. We had the presence of mind to ask, how much does it weigh? Simple question. The piece is coming from Europe. Shipping is going to be interesting. Uh, the answer was a few tons. When the piece landed in the States, it had broken through all the crates because of the weight, and the guesstimate at that moment was it weighs at least eight tons, which is about 16,000 U.S. pounds. Huh. So this posed a problem. Where were we going to install it? Stuart on Faye said, I think we should find a building. He had been thinking about moving his offices, and with the right building, he could be up front in the front part of the, bu the building, and then the parts of the art collection could be in the back. Now, when I say parts of the art collection, we did not move any of the art from the installations we had at home to this new building. We just continued to add to the collection. In less than a month, Stuart came home and said, we have the right building. It was a perfect setup. Because the back was one large space, we were able to create an office space for videos, a space created for an office, and a newly created space for a James Terrell. Then I have a separate ent entrance from the parking lot. So people, when they come to visit the collection, they don't have to walk through Stewart's offices to get into the art. Stuart did not want to build a lot of walls for installation. So instead, he said, what we're going to use are shipping containers. They work out perfectly because they're eight feet high, eight feet wide, 
and 20 feet long, and they offer us intimate gallery installations within the larger space. This new space has offered us the opportunity to collect new media, works of a different scale, and video. And this is part of our installation. What you're looking at is a cloud form by an artist whose name is Inigo Meglano Ovalle, based in uh, Chicago. And he, Inigo is a MacArthur Prize winner, which is one of the brain grants in the United States. And with the funds, he studied weather conditions and was really taken with cloud formations, especially storm cloud formations. This is a piece cut, made out of fiberglass covered in titanium leaf. And the reason that clouds were so appealing to him is because they can freely cross borders. That's all I'm going to say about the political climate in the United States. <laughs> we love to look at art and have managed to go to many of the major art fairs. As Stuart said to me last night, he said, I have had a wonderful time. I love looking at art. Nothing could warm my heart more. I, to know that you're doing something that you, actually, that you love and are passionate about, about is truly a gift. Six years ago, while we were in Basel, Switzerland, we were walking through a, the design fair and came across a piece, and we had one of those moments where Stuart looked at me and he said, do you see what I see? Okay, we're all going to see it. Maybe. Ah. So, on the left, in front of us was a low wood platform with small motorized mirrors that were lining each edge. There was a person walking on the platform, and the mirrors seemed to be following his movements. After watching for a while, we talked to the owner of the gallery, who then introduced us to the artists. We found out that they are random international, ra based in London, and creators of new media. Stuart and I were amazed by the work and acquired this and several other pieces. By way of background, Random International, begun by three graduates of the Royal College in London, is an amazing team whose work is comprised of art, design, and technology. What? Uh, that's a good. <laughs> so fast forward a year or so, and Random called from London to say they were developing a work and wanted us to come to London to experience it. And we did. The intention was a, a, a work that they wanted to create that would be a room-like space that you could walk into and it would be raining. And where you walked, it would stop raining. The work was titled, obviously, Rain Room, and Random needed support to advance the project. We said, go for it. And thus began our commission of Random International's Rain Room. Rain Room opened at the Barbican Center in London to lines that were three hours long the most well-attended art installation in the Barbican's history. Two of the people who experienced it were from the Museum of Modern Art. One rain room was installed there two years ago, and the lines were seven hours long. A rain room was recently gifted to the L.A. County Museum. For their installation, they pre-sold tickets. 17,000 were sold. We are beyond excited for Random International. Our rain room, which is the prototype, needs an addition to our building. And we're not quite there yet. Oop. In addition to random, we continue to collect new, midi new media and video. And this is an, an installation by an artist, another new media artist. His name is Pei Lang. 
we also collect work by Ziegel, Mom Coelho, Ann Litzelgaard, Jim Campbell, Peter Sarkeesian, and Bill Viola. Ah, there we are. So, Ziegel, Mom Coelho, Ann Litzelgaard, Jim Campbell, Peter Sarkeesian, and Bill Viola down on the bottom. Currently, there are about 450 artists whose works are in our collection, including work of artists from all continents except Antarctica. Here are a few examples of the artists in our collection born in South America. Helio Odesica, Willis de Castro, Ligia Clark, Marco Maggi, Barsotti, Dario Escobar, Olga D'Amaral, who happens to be a Cranbrook Art Academy alum, which is, I am the former chairman of the board for 13 years, and we are very proud of her. Uh, Carlos Cruz Diaz, Lucio Fontana, Sergio Camargo, and Ligia Puck. We are very fortunate as we share, Stuart and I share the same aesthetic. Several years ago, we were in an art fair, which I talked about in Miami where he went one way, I went the other way, we came together and we knew immediately that we were on to the same piece of art. Uh, it's remarkable to have that kind of in sync feelings. Each time we look at a new work, the questions we ask are, is this new, creative, and innovative? Is the work well made? Is the work resolved? Does it relate to the collection? Does it elevate the collection? And is it a one-off? We really don't think about what we're doing in terms of quote unquote buying art. We think of it in terms of building a collection. That doesn't mean we don't make U-turns. So if we say that we collect art that's minimal or abstract regardless of the material, we also collect ceramics that are done by an artist who is figurative. He made heads. So we included heads in, what, in the captions for what we do. To give you some examples of artists who fit these categories, we believe extremely well. Uh, the piece in the, in the foreground on the left is by the Lubinskys. They created beautiful major sculptures by developing innovative techniques for casting glass. They are, were in the forefront of the technology, but created beautiful, beautiful works. Behind the Lubinsky's work is a Donald Judd, and obviously a conceptualist who took sculpture off the pedestal, conceived the work for others to make. And then in the foreground on the right is a work by Mark de Suvero, master sculptor known for incredible works of steel, of scale, of steel in incredible works <laughs> of scale in steel, some up to 100 feet high. Background, the large ceramic piece is by Peter Volkus, and he was the first artist to turn the vessel into sculpture. She'll get the knack. It, it may take her a minute or two. Uh, this work is by John Mason. It's called The X Wall. Uh, this is a remarkable work in clay done in 1965. Forgive me for all the weights and measures, but it's 12,000 pounds. It's seven feet tall, and it's 14 feet wide. Uh, this was done in 1965 when technology wasn't what it is today. It's a gorgeous, incredible tour de force in clay. Now what you're looking at is the creation of a solid wall drawing at our building. Uh, the, the wall had 12 coats of paint as primer to create the surface that LeWitt wants in his wall drawings. It took five people 18 days to paint the wall and, uh, and we think it's absolutely pretty fantastic. It is not done with brushes, it's done with t-shirt material 
and it's, LeWitt had a certain process in mind. It's called Boom Boom. So the, the cloth is dipped in the paint, and then it's Boom Boom, Boom Boom, onto the wall, layers and layers and layers until you get the right color. Back in the 60s, LeWitt had a, a show at the Paula Cooper Gallery. And during the show, he wanted to hang a painting, but he didn't have one, and he didn't have time to make it. So he painted one right on the wall. When the show was over, he, Paula came to him and said, what do you want to do about this wall drawing, this drawing on the wall? And his answer was, just paint over it. And that became the concept for the Sal LeWitt wall drawings. And this is the, the finished wall drawing. In 2003, Alessi, the Italian design company, commissioned 20 international architects to design coffee and tea towers. Many were done using new technology, while a very few went into production from the original prototype. Some were revised before production, and some were never produced. Stuart and I felt this was a very important commission, and it should remain together. What you are viewing are all of the prototypes from that commission. And the one three down on the, three or four down on the right, is a Zaha Hadid. Thus far, you've seen some of the opportunities our building has provided. It has also provided opportunities to have musical performances. One of the groups that has performed is Eighth Blackbird, a contemporary classical chamber group comprised of six musicians. A few years ago, they came to us after performing at our space, and they said, we would like you, that won't do, we would like you to commission six composers from Brooklyn called Sleeping Giant. And they want, we want them to respond to artworks in your collection and write one-sixth, each one to write one-sixth of a piece that we will then perform. And by golly, the composers came from Brooklyn and they toured the collection and they spent close to a whole day looking at different art and then deciding which artworks they were going to respond to. They went back, and these are the artworks that they selected. It, interestingly enough, two from Random International, one from Ziegelbaum Coelho, and then the one down here, the only, this is one of our heads, Robert Arneson piece. Robert Arneson, a major ceramist, uh, going back to the mid-60s. The piece, the piece was completed. It was performed in January at Carnegie Hall. And the CD of the work is being released today. Amazing. Uh, we are beyond, I get goose pimples when I think about it. Uh, it's, it was really beyond anything that you could imagine. Uh, very, very exciting. Because it really, truly is what Stuart and I believe in, the integration of the arts. And I, one, just one thing. We believe all the arts should be integrated in education. I think, I think all, of our, all of our educational systems are missing the boat. So this adventure we're having is never ending. Stuart and I love looking, love being engaged with the visual and performing arts. We enjoy sharing our passion. I hope that's been communicated this morning. We love sharing with students, artists, curators, gallerists, and other collectors. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maxine. Um, 
this was only a, a glimpse at everything that um, is in your collection. Um, I actually I should, but I don't. How, how many pieces do you even know? You count? I'm sorry. I only. Okay, so we won't share that. So, um, so obviously, this is a collection of a, of a. This is a team collection. So, but tell us a little bit how you make decisions about an acquisition. Uh, you walk a fair, and how how does it work? What's the mechanics of it? She said it's called chills and whistles. Maybe I have I'll another. I'll talk about it. No, yes. We believe. Thank you. We believe that what arch you should have an emotional response to what you see. You should have a visceral response. It it should speak to you. That's that's what it is. Artists are cre are communicating feelings and emotions through their work in different ways. And if that's the first way we, re we respond. Stuart will whistle, and I get the chills. And then we definitely know we're on to something. And have we had any disagreements? One. In all of this collecting, which is beyond possible. At any rate, uh, very, very exciting. So uh, we're, that's one of the ways we do it. And we're always looking to add to artists whose work we've been collecting. So that's, that's another thing. If, when we come to the fair, we're looking for possibly looking at new work by an artist that we have, uh, different forms that they're creating, different possibilities. Have you ever fallen out of love with artworks and sold them? No. <laughs> we, we don't believe in it. No, it's not part of, we have, uh, truthfully, we have traded twice, three. three times. And that was for an artwork, a better artwork by the same artist. It's kind of a story. And we like to see how all the pieces fit in together. And how we began the collection and how our eyes have changed and how each piece kind of fits together. There's a rhythm to it. Oh, that's very nicely said. It's a family. You meaning you're, you know you have many children. Yeah, yes. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> a lot. So, so talk to the audience a little bit about um, also the support network you have. You know, I I know that you don't work with art advisors because you don't have to work with art advisors because you know exactly what you want and you have the best eye. Um, what about curators and how, how do you decide how to install the works, the, the process of managing the collection? The, the, I'll take the process of managing the collection and you could take the, the other side. Mm -hmm. the, the, we, I'm responsible for all the record keeping, all the data entry, whatever we have to, and we have a, we have a system that is, we, it works for us. So we have, we have a, a database, computer database, for each artist, each work of art. And then we have separate paper files. So there's a file for each artist, and in that file are separate subfiles for each work of art. And then I have, those are all hand done. And then I have a card file that I keep uh, based on media so that we know if, if I want to find works on paper, I can grab the cards. I don't have to, you know, go to the database. And then we also have a running inventory by year. And we have, we have one person working with us, and he's been with us now for almost seven years, and uh, he, his training is what, exactly what we needed. He has an MFA from Cranbrook and Ceramics. He has expertise in materials. He understands how to things up, 
how to, who to call if something, if we need a conservator, uh, if we need the framer, he can have a conversation with the framer about the appropriate way to frame something and then. And he does all the tours with me with our, with our colleges and universities in the region. Um, when we buy a piece, we never buy a piece with an idea where we're going to put it. We always buy a piece of the enjoyment and the, what it shows the person. And the appreciation of the piece itself. We will always find a place for it. Uh, I never had an art background. I never took an art class. I never read an art book. I still don't. I never read an art critic because I think they're all full of you know what. Um, so I came 25 years ago when we started. I came with a clean slate of no preconceived ideas. No one had told me we had to buy this or we had to buy that. that. So I came free spirited. The other thing that I had, which most people don't have, I had conviction in my eye. And I didn't need um, reaffirmation from a third party, should I buy it or shouldn't I buy it? And the worst I could have done is made a mistake. But I really didn't care because we weren't buying something as an investment. You know, were we buying something to be socially acceptable? We were buying something for the true appreciation of the art. So that allowed us, or allowed me more than Maxine, to really explore all options with no boundaries and no parameters, which really helped us put the collection together. The, the installation is a lot easier than most people think it is. What I'll do is I'll wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and I'll say to myself, how would that look with that? Or how would that go here with this? And what we try to do is mix all the media together. So in every room, you will find all five different medias because there's interrelationships between the artists. They, most of them worked in more than one media. Most of them were influenced by another artist. And they really is a dialogue or communication between them. So we don't do anything thematic under any circumstance. And um, it's been a, a, a challenge, but wonderful experience of how the, the story is told through, through the installation of art. We seldom move stuff. Sometimes when we buy new things, we have to make some adjustments. Some adjustments. But basically, the stuff at the house has remained at the house. The stuff at the warehouse has kind of remained at the warehouse. And I have to make nooks and crannies to put new things where I think they're appropriate. You. Maxine, you mentioned, you, you just talked about um, um, the curator who helps you with the tours. Tell us a little bit about your activity with education, uh, your interest in how the visual and performing arts are important and what you do because I think it's, a, it's very special because uh, hundreds of um, students come to your collection every, every year. We, we started a program uh, more than 15 years ago and with the professors at most of the colleges and universities in the region. And the, the professor calls and makes an appointment and he can bring or she can bring up to 15 students, sometimes 20, depending uh, on what the group is. And they get a list of all the artists in the part of the collection that they're coming to visit. And the students are expected to research at least 20 of those artists and then Ben and I take them on a tour, which usually takes anywhere from two to three hours uh, at the house or at the building, either one. Uh, and they have to talk about the artists in front of the work. And the professor usually tells them, you want to give Maxine information that she doesn't know. So it's not about, to, the artist was born here and the artist, you know, it's really about looking at the art and learning about it so that the, the impact of taking the tour is meaningful to them. And somebody once asked me, well, what happens if the students don't research the artists? And the, my answer was simple. Then the professor can't come back. And we are really the, the local resource for most of these, for students to see most of these artists. We love it. And in addition to that, I was for 13 years chairman of the board of the Cranbrook Academy of Art and uh, that is the only independent Masters of Fine Arts program in the United States and have mentored 
13 graduating classes. So uh, it's been very, very exciting and rewarding. T tell us about, do you, are you interested in relationships with the artists you collect? Is that, is that part of, of what, um, what enriches the experience or don't you care? Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think that's part of the a part of our message, and one one thing that we think is so important. And then I'll go on to the relate. Yes, we have relationships with many of the artists, uh, because in many cases we have the definitive collection of their work. That's a huge responsibility, and we don't take it lightly. That's why uh, buying art as an investment is appalling to us, because you're dealing with the li lives of people and their careers. And that's not something to play with. Uh, we take it very seriously. And we've had ver many, many interesting experiences with our artists, including Mark DeSuvero. Should I tell that story? Yeah, please. So Mark is, Mark is based in New York, and he's a man now in his 80s. And we collect, we have small DeSuveros, large DeSuveros, larger DeSuveros, and love the work. And, and he called one day and he said, when will you and Stuart be in Ann Arbor? And I said, we'll be there Saturday night for dinner. We frequently go to Ann Arbor for concerts. And he said, uh, okay, let's have dinner. Now he's in New York. And I said, okay, that's great, thinking he probably had a meeting with the museum or something in Ann Arbor. And we met at a restaurant. He came in with a tube. And uh, he sat down at dinner and I said, what are you doing in Ann Arbor? And he said, I came to take you to dinner. Huh. So we started to eat dinner and he said, before we start, I want you to have this. And he said, this is an example of each of my prints. He said, I want, I want to give you this gift because you've been so supportive of my work and this is my way of thanking you. And to this day, I'm still, uh, it was the, the most generous, most thoughtful thing and that's, that's not unusual in the kind of relationship we have with our artists. Very special. Do you ever buy directly from an artist? We, Maxine's answer is we try not to. Uh, because we want to have, we want to be a step removed. We think it's important to make the decision not based on our feeling for the artist, but based on is this, is this good work that he's doing, or is he or she in between what's, what's going to happen next. We much prefer to work with the galleries uh, because we believe in the gallery system and we think it's vital for artists to be able to be seen in, in gallery settings, so. That was our only disagreement in 25 years where we bought directly from an artist and Maxine says, you made a mistake. <laughs> so and it was a mistake? It was, yeah. it was. So I called the artist the next day and said, uh, in light of what we already own of your work, we don't think this fits. He was understanding and we've subsequently bought other work from, from him, from the same artist. Because if you get wrapped up in the emotion of being at the, at the studio and the relationship and you don't look objectively at the art. So, so then talk a little bit about the relationships with the galleries that you work with. We, ha we have had relationships with galleries uh, for more than 25 years. And that can, th those, those relationships continue. We are, thanks to, you know, in the old days, forgive me, in the old days uh, it was done by mail and slides. And, you know, in fact, then it became fax. And now with, with, the digital age, things come instantaneously. You know, get an email and, and a gallery will say, we have this work, we know you're interested in this artist, and, uh, and we're gonna send you these images. I, th I think the important relationships we have is that the galleries know the, the extent of the collection, and they know what our aesthetic is, and, that we, and they know that we are seriously interested in adding to the collection. So they're helping us not, they're not selling us art. I think the most important thing they're trying to do with our support and help is help us build 
a museum quality collection, to fill in gaps, and sometimes to expose us to artists that we're not familiar with. Um, so we probably get a dozen JPEGs a week. We have a Sunday night meeting at the breakfast room table with the, with the JPEGs, and we decide. And we buy a significant amount of work off the JPEGs. And believe it or not, we've never returned anything. Uh, it's been remarkable. And they have been not a dealer, they've been a partner. And I think that's the relationship you have to have if you're going to try to take the collection where we're trying to take it. It's the partnership. So what would be, or what is your advice to, to people who just start collecting or don't know how to go about it or are interested or uh, um, what do you tell people? It's, it's you have a lot of young people come to your collection and I'm sure they always ask you, what should we do? How do we, where to start? I don't think there's a starting point. I think you have to be open-minded. I think you have to be willing to look at everything. I think, and the more you see, the, 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 um, the more honed in your objective is or your eye is. And you have to be willing to take the first step. And you can't worry about, if I paid $1,000, is it going to be worth $1,500 tomorrow? You have to really decide, is this something I want to do? And does the piece that you're looking at emotionally excite you? Um, I'll tell one story that Maxine doesn't like that I tell, but I'll tell it anyhow. We had dinner one night with a director of a gallery who had two PhDs. Director of a museum. Of a museum. He had two PhDs. I apologize for gallery chat. I said that. I've had no educational background when it comes to art. So I said to him, you come from a very, very strong academic background, and I come from no academic background. Can you look at a piece of art and separate academia from emotional response? He said, no. I said, guess what? He said, what? I said, you're in the wrong business. It's way too much academia. You have to allow yourself to really enjoy what you're looking at and not be afraid to take the first step to look at it. And the, there's, there's something else I think that's really key because we really believe in this, this piece about education and what you're doing when you're looking at art is training your eye. You're becoming more and more visually acute. And today, in many respects, it's much easier because you can go online. Things are immediately accessible. You, you can look at websites. You can do all that. You can go to gallery websites and they have the lists of artists and they have the images online so you can see it and then you can go to the gallery and, and see it in real time. But the visual acute part is really key. It's a key to who we are. Tell them the story about the University of Michigan Medical Center. So the just, to sh just to show you where art's going and how important visual acuteness is. So today, because the other side of what's going on with technology, because of computers and because of cell phones and all this nonsense that we have, people are not looking. So how do you train doctors and scientists? Well, what they're doing, University of Michigan Medical School now has a program, started out as a pilot program, where they're taking their medical students into the museum and they're spending time there training them to look at the art so that when they go in to see a patient, they're actually looking at the patient and not just the chart. And then when they leave the room of the patient, they're given a pencil and a piece of paper and asked to draw what they saw. So it's, this is, there, art has, has a vast implication for our lives going into the future. Wow. And we know that museums and museum shows also play a major role in this. Are you, are you actively and willingly and happily lending to museums when they come and ask you? Because I can imagine with uh, your co collection you get requests all the time. I, uh, this, is, this is very important uh, for those that are collectors here, dealers. 
I, we, we have had good experience. good experience since not good experiences. And rather than tell you about the experiences, let me tell you what we've done as a response to those experiences. So we now have our own loan form, uh, which Christiane was helpful in writing so that it's, in, it's consistent with our, uh, with our insurance. Uh, the, we insist that um, our insurance company, that the, the museum carry our insurance, not their insurance. We don't want to be insured under them. We want to be insured under AXA because we know that if there's a problem, AXA will take care of it. Uh, the second thing is we have loaned a major Kiefer painting to his exhibition at the Pompidou. Now, briefly, uh, the painting is a canvas, but it has these huge clay slabs hanging off the canvas. We had to bring a conservator from New York to Michigan to look at the painting, make sure that the clay was attached okay, that it didn't need any kind of conserving, and to design the, the uh, right. crate in which it would travel, and to designate how it should be shipped, which was flat, not standing up. That costs four times the amount of money because of the size of the painting. Uh, the painting was shipped to Paris, where an AXA representative met it at the museum before it was uncrated so that the, they could take a condition report and we knew the condition before it was uncrated and then was there as it came out of the crate. The AXA representative will be at the museum when the painting comes off the wall to watch as it's put back in its crate and then shipped back to Michigan. It's unbelievable. And, and when you're shipping things that are very fragile, you have to do the best you possibly can. Uh, we, we don't want to have any horror stories. Uh, we're, our works are too precious to us. And can I just tell you one other thing? We are grandparents. And, and, we, and our grandchildren, <laughs> I am. I am, Stuart isn't, but I am. Uh, and what we've done with our grandchildren, because as you can see, it's really testy to be in our house. Uh, we, have, we have this thing where they, we take them on a tour and we walk around the collection with them and they talk about the works that they like and they can touch some of them with one finger. So there is no fear about coming to Graham and Grandpa's. You know how that could be? So that's, that's the, the other side of the story. <laughs> well, before, um, one more question. When you lend a work, do you miss it? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like we all miss our kids when they're away. So, anybody in the audience have a question for Maxine or Stuart? Um, I'll tell you one other thing. We couldn't do what we did without being a partnership. And you can't and I mean it sincerely, it takes both people have to have a common objective, a common interest, and a common commitment. Um, this has changed our lives all for the better, but it really had to be the partnership. And if you ask both of us, it's probably the best thing other than our marriage that we've ever done together. And our kids. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> É, eu fiquei muito surpresa por eles colecionarem é, arte e tecnologia, algumas obras com novas mídias. Eu fiquei surpresa por ver algumas obras com novas mídias e algumas na sua coleção tem obra de arte e tecnologia. E eu gostaria de saber como você vê a recepção é, des, desses novos artistas que estão trabalhando com novas tecnologias, principalmente com tecnologias contemporâneas. E como vocês lidam com a efemeridade da obra? Porque muitas, é, muitas obras precisam estar conectadas ou ligadas à web ou são obras interativas 
como vocês estão lidando com essa mudança de, de linguagem e de material mesmo, porque são efêmeras. Não, na verdade, não é efêmero. As trabalhos que temos, o computador já está embedado no trabalho. And with the random international pieces, they periodically make a house call. They will come from London and advance the technology for us. Okay. The, the, uh, the part where we may have a problem is with video. And we must continue to upgrade the technology for the video. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, do you have plans for the collection in the future? You're going to pass for your kids, you're going to donate for an institution. What do you have in mind? What do you have in mind? <laughs> um, that's probably the most difficult decision we have to make. Um, and we're torn, to be honest with you. Um, present time, the children don't have the commitment that we have. But they're at a different age and we have a different priority. Uh, I'm not a lover. I use the word I when I should say we. Here, here. Um, of giving a significant part of the art collection to an institution which has 200,000 pieces, and once every 20 years it sees the light of day. Uh, so we are torn to what we may do with it. It could go to multiple institutions. We could do our own institution like Bro did in California. But the most important thing we really want to do is keep the collection intact uh, for a number of reasons. A, because of how we put it together. B, because of the interrelationship of the pieces together. And to see the message that the, con the collection conveys. So uh, that's a very difficult question, and we don't have the answer, to be honest with you. Thank you. Oi, é, bom dia. É, às vezes, nesse né, circuito de arte, de é, exposições, né, e principalmente a semana da SP Arte, é, a gente tem vários tipos de... como institucional, independente, oficial, né, é, circuitos, né? E, por um momento, eu sinto que, talvez, nessas semanas de, de Bienal, elas são, talvez, um pouco não acessíveis para pessoas que não têm é, um poder monetário é, ou, talvez, mais oportunidade para estudar e trabalhar com arte. É, onde vocês acham que, nesses eventos... É, ou nessas semanas é, entra essa essa oportunidade para as pessoas que não têm é, tanto acesso a comprar uma entrada a, a poder comprar uma obra a, a visitar uma Bienal inteira mas saber que não tem acesso aquilo é, quais são os caminhos que uma pessoa que não tem é, um acesso monetário entra nesse mundo que, por momentos, é tão fechado? Uh, uh, Let me give you some examples from the United States. Okay. One, of, 
one of the things that we've, we've done, uh, and it happens in Chicago at the art fair, it happens down in Miami with the art fairs, is that the, there are times when groups of students come through, the arrangements are made by the college or university directly with the people that put on the fair. Uh, there are opportunities for other groups to come through. It's something that is, that is arranged through the colleges and universities and through the office of the, the management of the art fair. And that, I think that that's an effective way of doing it. And we do it, we do it with senior citizens, all different kinds of groups. Thank you for your question. Uh, I, I want to add to this. It, I was speaking Portuguese, so you can translate. Um, I don't know who has asked the question, mas é, aqui também acontece a mesma coisa. Vocês todos estão usando uma pulseira para entrar de graça na feira. A Bienal é de graça na feira. Uh, você não precisa ter recursos para fruir arte nem na Bienal, nem numa feira de arte, nem nas galerias, nem nas instituições. Então, eu só queria... E 4 mil ingressos são distribuídos aqui em São Paulo para as escolas é, do ensino médio, para faculdades, professores e alunos, e tem vários grupos que entram de quinta a domingo usando esses ingressos. Então, só queria adicionar, a, 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 a acrescentar a resposta da Maxine, muito boa, que é, são os mecanismos que as instituições, as feiras, os, alguns museus também têm os dias gratuitos, que sempre dispõem para facilitar o acesso das pessoas. A fruição da arte é gratuita, na verdade, tá? 